So welcome to Math 140 Calc 2. So I have that this is lecture 28 and it is April 25th. I'm more confident on the second than the first. But somewhere around there. Ah, oh, good. And the daily Java update is just happening. All right. So what I want to do today is you know, I want to keep to the promise of devoting a bunch of classes to review. And so I'm not necessarily going to be reviewing the material we've been doing in this class, but just material we've been doing in related classes that are good to know. So I want to talk a little bit about related rates. This is one of the problems that often causes a lot of heartache when people are first doing calculus, but it's also one of the most useful. If I have a bunch of quantities that are related, hence the name related rates, if I know how one is changing, what do I know about the others? So for example, you know, one of the standard ones is imagine you have a spherical balloon and you're inflating it, and you are having a certain amount of air per second. So what will be the units for the amount of air that you have? Cubic inches or cubic centimeters. I probably would not talk about cubic meters you know, for the amount of air that I'm adding into a little balloon that you would buy at the store. Because you know, if you talk about you know, something that's a noticeable cubic meter, it would just completely wrong scale. And then you might want to know how is the radius changing? How is the surface area of the room changing as a function of time, given that I'm putting in this much here per second? So we'll talk about uh, maybe some problems related to this. And maybe we'll talk a little bit about you know, what one has the greatest volume for a given surface area. So the surface area, I could easily see that as I have so much surface to build an object with. And I want to choose the form that's going to maximize the volume for a given amount of material. There is a little bit of indeterminacy in this. How are we going to define the surface area for the cone? What does that mean? What is the surface area? Something like this. So, what's the surface here? Where do you get it? What's the source of indeterminacy? You've got a water bottle on the table, correct? Right? How would you calculate the surface here of the water? Split it up. So, what would be the components? The top and the bottom, the bases, and then the stuff going around. So, when I talk about the surface area for a where's the indeterminacy? How do, well, not just how to split it, but do I split it? Am I including the bottom? So, when I talk about a cone, do I include the base as part of the surface area that I have closed cone? Or is this more like an ice cream cone where you know, the top is open? And so whenever you have problems, you have to make sure that the problem is very well traced so that you know what to do. A uh, related optimization problem is you're splitting the integer to n to a sum of non-negative integers such as the product is maximum. It turns out studying this problem reviews almost all of capital. It's a wonderful, wonderful problem. And this application, this is not just a busybody problem. It is actually a problem that has information to help you efficiently store information on the computer. And in doing that, we're going to actually see some strange functions to differentiate. And so some of these, you know, homework problems you get in Cal when you find the derivative of this function, it looks like the professor's just being you know, real SOB, giving you these strange functions. These functions actually do sometimes arise. And then if there's time, we'll probably will look to so I'll save this for a future lecture. Can we prove a circle closes the largest area of the so this is related to the proper ground problem. We did, if you have a rectangle, the best rectangle is a square. What do you think the best triangle is? Equal that. And so that would be an interesting thing to prove. There is a formula for the area of a triangle as a function of the sides. And once you know two sides of the triangle, you know the third side. Of it. And you could go, well, what if I had a pentagon or a hexagon or a heptagon and so on and so on? Can you prove that for an n-gon, 
the dust and body of fluid is irregular? If so, then it seems like maybe some kind of limiting argument might give you that the circle does best. All right, so let's try to talk about uh, cone. So for given length L, what cone has the greatest volume for a given surface area? And I'm not going to include the base. So we have to, first of all, determine what is the surface area. We discussed how to find the volume, right? The volume wasn't so bad. So the volume, it came from rotating, if we have the line, y equals, I guess this would be, we'll do mx plus b. So x would be 1 over m y minus b. Right? And we would rotate it, and we would get something like this. Right? So what was our formula for volume? We would integrate y goes from 0 to b, and then it would be pi, and then the radius is going to be x, which is why I'm writing this 1 over m y minus b, which would be 1 over m y minus b all squared dy. So it would be pi over m squared. And then we have the integral. y goes from 0 to b of y minus b squared dy. This would be pi over m squared y minus b cubed over 3 times 0 No, okay. yeah. For a second, I thought I made an algebra mistake that this was going to be zero. Because when I put in y equals b, I get zero. But what do I get when I put in y equals zero? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. When I'm evaluating y minus b cubed over 3, what do I get when I put in y equals zero? Not negative field. Negative b cubed, which is because I'm subtracting this because it's low bound, it becomes positive b cubed. So I do actually have a positive y, so I get pi b cubed over 3 and squared. So this it would be the volume. And then we talked about you know, what to do last time if we want the rod to have length L. So if the rod has length L, That's going to affect what m and what b are. So what would what would b equal if the rod has like l? Well, it's going to also depend on m, right? So if rod of length l, then m and b are functions. But one of them is easier than the other. Can I choose anything I want for the slope of the line? If, if I have slope zero, it's not possible. That's just a horizontal line. Right. And then my slope is going to have to be negative. So I can just keep having the slope going down until negative infinity. I can take anything. So m actually ranges freely. And then B is going to be a function of M and L. So really, and choose any M in zero to negative infinity, I guess I should have And then B is a function of M. And so we discussed how to do that last time. So what I want to do today is I want to just set things up so that you can then do the rest of the calculation. And you can see, you know, are you able to find a nice answer? But we can, and we showed last time how to find B as a function of M and L. Right, now we have to discuss surface area. 
So surface area is not a problem. So we call it the lengths of curves. It was either the integral x goes from x initial to x final of the square root of one plus dy dx squared dx, or the integral t goes from t initial to t final, the square root of x prime of t squared plus y prime of t squared dt. And again, x prime of t is you know, dx dt. So if you think about what's going on, if I bring the dt inside the integration, this x prime of t is really like dx dt squared. I bring in a dt. What happens if you bring something inside a square root? So if you bring two inside a square root, what do you get? When two moves inside a square root, what does it become? The square root of what is two? Four. So when two comes inside the square root, you have to square it. If I bring three inside the square root, what do you get? Right. So if I bring dt inside the square root, it's going to become a dt squared. So this is like the integral t goes from ti to tm, the square root of dx dt squared dt squared plus dy dt squared dt squared, which is like the integral of dx squared plus dy squared square root. And then if I pull out the dx, it's like one plus dy dx squared dx. Now, put that in the highlight. You know, this is, of course, playing fast and loose with the mathematics. And just you know, to give you a sense of why we have these relations between the two different ways. I give you the parametrized curve. So in this version, I know my curve C of T is X of T, Y of T. You give me a time, I tell you where I am in space. And I can then find the length of the curve by using something like this. And this formula generalizes very nicely to what would happen if we had a curve in three dimensional space. The other one, the square root of one plus D Y dx squared, you know, we, we talked about how we did this for like three months sum. You know, we had a curve, we broke it up into you know, a lot of points that were close. And on each one of these, we drew the small little polygonal path connecting. And we used that to approximate the curve. And so these were the formulas to find the length of the curve. So there's two parts to these problems. One is setting things up. And the second is after you've set up doing the integration, what makes you concerned about your ability to do this integration or my ability to do this integration? Why are, not, why are we not excited? Square roots, right? You know, if you ask me which of my children do I love the most, you know, that's not a question I can answer. When they were young, I could answer. I could say, why was love better than I could? That was enough to push it to the top. If you ask me which kind of integrals do I prefer doing, you know, volumes or lengths, volumes, right? In volumes, what did we do? We squared the radius. I in squaring, I like the squaring of the radius. That's usually going to be something that I have a chance of being able to do. Square root going in the other oh, no way. Absolutely not. And this is why. You know, lengths of curves is so difficult. And this should give you some intuition as to why surface areas are so difficult. We actually have beautiful formulas for the area of an ellipse or the volume of an ellipse. We do not have good formulas for the length of an ellipse or the surface area of an ellipse. So now, let's say we want to continue and let's say we do want to do a surface area. So let's again, you know, say we have some curve that we're rotating. So we have something like this. Yeah. 
I'm going to rotate my curve y equals f of x about the y axis. So to find the volume, what we did is we broke it up into a bunch of cylinders and we added the volume of each of the cylinders. And the cylinders had what kind of thickness? Do you want? So we had something like this. So if we want the surface area, what would we do now? So to find the volume, we took the volume of the disks and added them. What would we now do to find an approximation for the surface area? Add the surface area. And so if we're adding the surface here, what's the surface area of the cylinder that we care about? Do I include the top or not? So I don't include the top. So add surface area of the disks without the top or bottom. What's the radius? At height y, Radius is what? Is x, which is f inverse of y. You need to invert the function. So depending on what function I give you, this may or may not be easy. I right, now we need to find the length of that curve. And so now, we're viewing it not as y is a function of x, but x is a function of y. So view, let's so if we let f inverse equal g, we have x equals g of y. So the length is going to be the square root of one plus dx dy squared. Because I'm flipping the roles of x and y. If this bothers you, what you can do is just say, screw this, let me rotate my world by 90 degrees, and let me rotate the cone about the x-axis, and then everything is going to align with what I want. Absolutely fine to do that. But what we're really doing is we're just flipping the roles of x and y. So rather than having dy dx with the dx outside, we have now dx dy with the y. And so now I would integrate from um, y goes from y initial to y final. Now, what's going to be the area? It's going to be 2 pi r times the thickness. Right. So it should be something like 2 pi. Um, what's the R? R is going to be x, right? Which is f inverse of y, square root of 1 plus. So x is f inverse of y. So it's f inverse prime squared dy. And this is the integral you would need to do. This is one of the few cases where we can actually do the integral because f inverse prime is going to just be a constant. We have y equals mx plus b. For us, it was you know, x equals 1 over m y minus b. So dx dy is just 1 over m. So the integration, at least from the square root, is not going to be bad. Yeah, if it was y isn't that bad, this is all true. So what you can do now is you can actually find a formula for the surface area of a curve. Yeah. We can use calculus to do this. And then what you can do is you can then say, for a given surface area, maybe what volume is going to be the greatest? Well, we know what the volume is as a function. Okay, which might be j. 
we can just check each one of these. So again, I'll leave this as an exercise for you if you're interested. What I hope you see is it's clear how you do the calculation that this is doable, that we can find formulas for something like this, but only because we're taking a really nice function with a straight line. If we took a parabola and tried to do that, all of a sudden we would have the square root of like a one plus y squared. And that's not going to be a pleasant degree. Every now and then, some of these things can be done. If we have them in the denominators, it's sometimes a little bit better. We have to try to move our tree substitution, but it gets painful. All right. Any questions on this part? Okay. So, what I want to do now is I want to go to the second question. integer n is a sum of non-negative integers such as the product is maximized, what is the best way to do this? Why do you think I want the sum to be of non-negative integers? Why don't, why can't I use negative integers to try to maximize the product? Well, I'll make sure my product is, well, I want to maximize my product, so I would never choose anything that gives me a negative product. So if I'm using negative numbers, how many negative numbers must I use? Two, four, six, even number. What can I do to the product if I want the sum to be n and I can use some negative numbers? Give me a way to write n as a product with three numbers where two of them are negative. As a product as a sum of three numbers where two are negative. It's going to have a large product. Let's take negative n for my first, which I take for my second. I want the sum to be and I want two negative numbers, which I take for my second. Negative n, excellent. And which I take for my third. Not positive n, close. Want the sum to be n. So if I took positive n, my sum would be negative n. I take 2n, my sum would be 0. What should I take? 3n. And the product is going to just be 3n squared. More generally, I could take n equals negative. You know, m n negative m n plus two uh, m plus one n product is going to be two m plus one times m squared. And this should be n cubed. Sorry. N cubed. As m goes to infinity. Product goes to infinity. So if I can use negative numbers, I can make my product arbitrarily large. This problem is not interesting. Okay. What if one of the summons was zero? What would that mean? Let's take a take a closer to some of non-negative numbers. Why aren't I allowed to use a zero? Yeah, the product would be zero. So if I'm trying to find the largest possible product, you know, I can just take n equals n. So clearly zero is not the best I can do. So clearly never use zero as a summon. Makes the product zero. Okay. So what we want to do is we want to write n as a1 plus dot 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 plus a n with a1 a n maximized. We know each a i is at least one. But we don't know how many terms there are. And we don't know what their values are. So let's try to think about this. I deliberately did not want you to think about this before. We have a clear lower bound for the eights. It has to be at least one. Let's see if we can get an upper bound. 
Do you think we would ever want to use a number like a as a number? Do you think we would ever want to sum in as large as eight? So if we had a sum of eight, what could we replace it with? So I need to replace eight with something that we have the sum of eight that will have a larger product. So what could you replace eight? Four and four. The simplest thing I could do though would be two and six. That's going to generalize the nicest. So I could replace eight with six plus two product is 12. I could replace nine with seven plus two product is 14. So is it clear that we would never have a eight in the logic system? Do we ever want to sum? Good, so what can we replace seven with? Yeah, this is why I'm using two. Two is the smallest thing I can use, and it's the one I can use the longest. If I did four, four is fine with four plus four, but then eventually I'm going to get to the point where I'm going to have a number less than four. If I use two, I can keep doing this longer. So the product is 10. Six would be four plus two. Product would be eight. Five would be three plus two. The product is six. What about four? We're indifferent. But actually, you know what? Let's just always replace fours with twos because then we can say, look, we never want to use a four. So we now know one less than equal to AI less than equal to three. So AI is in one, two, or three. Would any of the AIs ever be one? It doesn't help the product. So if one of the AIs was one, what would you do with it? So if one of your terms was one, what should you do? So imagine we write n as a1 plus a2 plus dot 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 plus a7 plus 1 plus a8 plus n. So imagine one of the terms was 1. What should we do with that? It's not helping the product. So what should we do to it? Okay, but how do we get rid of it? Well, no, but it's we're trying to decompose n. So imagine we have a decomposition. One of the terms is a one. Can you give me a better decomposition? What should I do to that one? I want to make the product larger. It's a waste to have a sum in the one. So what should I do to that value of one? Where should I put it? Should I put it in the last term? Well, that would make the last term larger, right? And then that would help the product. So I could take the one and just feed it into here and write n as a one plus a seven. Oh, this should really be a nine. So a nine plus dot 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 plus. And now the last one is a n plus one. So product is larger. So it was a waste to have a one. I can make my product larger by just putting it in the last term. Therefore, each AI is either two or three. Okay. 
we're all, we all good on this? So we only want to use twos in space. Okay, we're almost there. Which do you think is better, using a lot of twos or using a lot of threes? So what's the exchange rate between twos and threes? So that again, three twos for every two threes. So three plus three equals two plus two plus two. What's the product? What's the product of three plus three? Try again. Nine. What's the product of two plus two plus two? Eight. So we want to have more threes and twos. So basically the answer is all threes and one or two twos. Yes, because we know that we only need to use twos and threes. And every time we have three twos, we can replace the three twos with two threes. It doesn't change the sum. Any questions so far? So if you imagine the number line, here's zero, here's one, here's two, here's three. And so we have two here, we have three here. Does anybody know any interesting numbers between two and three? Any interesting numbers between two and three? Mathematics. Probably there is such a number given that I'm asking. Anybody think of it? Yeah, what's E? So E is approximately 2.73. Two eight, which is closer to three than to two. And what's really working is that E is closer to three than two. So we're going to see now why that's the case. So what we're going to do is we're going to repeat what we're doing. Set the integers. What I'm going to do I'll replace them with no negative numbers. Such as the product is maximized. So the only difference is that no longer with the line to be integers. So we still will write n as a1 plus a2 plus an. We want to maximize the product. Remember, we don't know what little n is, we don't know what the best number of terms is. We know each ai is in the interval. One. We technically know it's not one, but it's, it's easier to work with the closed interval when you include the endpoints. Because in analysis, we learn that if we have a closed interval where we include the endpoints, a continuous function will take on its maximum number of values. If I give you a function one over x, as you get closer and closer to zero, one over x shoots up to infinity. It doesn't take on its maximum value. But if it's closed, we will have to take on its maximum value. So the arguments we did before tell us each of these numbers is between one and four. And so we want to try to maximize this. 
Now the problem is we don't know what the what the best number of terms n is. So let's do it if we can. So solve for each n. So case one, n equals one. What's the solution? So we can only use one term. What's the best way to take place? Yeah, we have no choice. N equals N. So case two, N equals two. So the solution is we want to write A1 plus A2 equals N, and we want to maximize A1 times A2. Does anybody recognize this problem? It is. This is the problem problem. Therefore, A1 equals A2 equals N over 2. So we know what the answer is when N equals 2. So now, let's do the general case. So I'm going to make an assumption in the interest of time. I'm going to appeal to result from analysis that there is at least one optimal choice for each end. So. By analysis, there is at least one optimal choice. Imagine we have A1 plus A2 plus dot 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 plus An equals N is optimal for product. If all are not equal, Without loss of generality, we can assume A1 is less than A2. Is everybody comfortable? There's got to be some optimal solution. Let's assume we have one. Let's assume not all the elements are the same. So if necessary, we relabel to just make it the first two elements. And if they're not the same, it's the Farmer Brown problem. We do better with A1 plus A2 over 2 and A1 plus A2 over 2. Same sum, larger product. So optimal has each An equal N over N. So far, so good. And again, this is mathematics at its best. We're being lazy. Ways. We always, always, always try to reduce to something we only know. We know how to handle the case when there's just two. So let's just try to reduce to that. If they weren't all the same, then two of them have to be unequal. And for the two that are unequal, we're going to say, ah, oh, we can make it better by just replacing it to the average. Okay. So now we're getting closer. So for any n, best product is going to be, say, f of n equals n divided by a little n raised to the n power. And so we have to find the value of little n that makes this largest, right? So optimize over little n in one, two, three, dot, dot, dot. This is a tough problem. This is a problem of integer optimization. Everything we've done has been on you know, continuous functions, differentiable functions. So we need to find a function that behaves similar to this that we can study. Can anybody think of a related function 
that will equal this function when x is an integer? G of x should be what? Somebody give me a function that would reduce to this when x is an integer. Sorry? Well, well, then when x equals n, little n, does that equal big n or little n to the n? I want something that when I let little x equal little n, I get big n over little n to the n. What should I take to g? Think back to the integral test. How do we use the integral test? We took the index and we replaced the index with that here. It's just big N over X to the X, just like integral test. Replace index with X. And this is one of the reasons why I'm doing this problem. It's a great way to be doing it. If you're having trouble figuring out what to do, I just want to replace my index with X. So I can write this with a little bit of algebra at E to the natural log of n over x times x, or e to the x natural log of n minus the natural log of x. And remember that we used log to, be, to know natural log in college. Right, and so if you're not sure if this is correct, if you just take the log of both sides, the log of n over x to the x is just x natural log of n over x. When we take the log of this, we just get x natural log of n over x. All right, so these are the same. And now, how do I find where a function is maximized? What do I do? So I put points. What else? End points. Don't make me run into the door. So g of 1, so when x equals 1, I just get n and you know as i go to infinity i would get zero so it's not an endpoint so we would have g of x is e to the x log of n over x g prime of x is e to the x natural log of n over x times, I now need the derivative of this. So I'm going to do it very slowly. So this is e to the x natural log of n over x. And then the derivative, so x times natural log of n, the derivative of that is just going to be natural log of n. And then I need the derivative of x log x. I use the product rule. And I'm going to get the derivative of x is 1, so it'll be the log of x minus x. And the derivative of log of x is 1 over x. So this is e to the x natural log of n over x times the log of n minus the log of x. And I can write the log of, I can write 1 as just the log of e. Right, the natural log of e is just one. And this way I can combine everything. e to the x log n over x times the log of n over x e. So a critical point has g prime of x equals zero or the log of n over x e equals zero. When does the log of n over x equals zero? The log of what number is zero? Not quite. What number has a log of zero? Log of what is zero? One. So n over x e equals one. Therefore, x equals n over e. So the number of pieces is n over e. Each piece 
of size e. So we want each piece to be of size e. Okay. The problem is we can't necessarily do this because I don't think we might have to do this. But here's where things are very interesting. So g prime of x was equal to g of x times the log of n over x e. And this gives me an opportunity to talk about plotting functions. So here is the x-axis. And here is, say, g prime of x. And now we know when x equals n over e, the derivative is equal to 0. When x is less than n over e, do we have the log of a number greater than 1 or less than 1? So if x is smaller than n over e, we have the log of a number that's greater than 1. So what will be the derivative? The derivative is positive or negative? Positive. Your g of x is always positive. This is always positive. So the derivative is going to be positive up until we get to n over e. Once x is n over e, is the derivative positive or negative? Well, it's 0 at n over e, and then when we go beyond n over e, is it positive or negative? Negative. So look at this. I know what my plot looks like. When I'm plotting things, my function has to be increasing up until zero and then decreasing. So this is the real max. And then the integer max is either the smallest integer larger than n over e or the largest integer smaller than n over e. So this is one of the few situations where you can pass from a real optimal to an integer optimal. And notice how much great material we got to review today. We got to review taking derivatives of you know, complicated functions. And, you know, I did it a little bit rapidly. If you have trouble, do the calculation properly. We had to the exponentials. We were using the chain rule. We were using the product. We talked about the sign of the derivative and how that gives us information as to are we increasing or decreasing. We did a little bit of curve study. We talked a little bit about optimization, your critical points, endpoints. We were very fortunate here that we could pass to the integer optimal from the real optimal. We talked a little bit about the integral test and how the difficulty was by giving you a sequence a n, you have to find a real value function that's differentiable. And typically, you just replace the index with x. That's what we do here as well. So this problem reviews almost everything. And the application, it turns out to be more efficient to store information in base 3 than base 2. And that's the application. So base 3 is more efficient than base 2 for storage I'll try to remember to send an article on that. But this is a really nice application. We still use base two because computers just love base two and it's not worth switching to base three. But if you have a tremendous amount of information that you really need to save and don't really need to access, base three is not a bad thing to consider. All right, so this is a good place to stop for the day.